As my term as High Commissioner draws to a close, this Council's milestone 50th session will be the last which I brief. This Council, for all of the difference of its member, remains central to protecting and promoting the human rights that lie at the heart of our common humanity. It has proven its ability to do that, and I therefore encourage you all to continue to seek dialogue, to be willing to hear the other, to understand respective points of view, and to actively work towards identifying common ground as prerequisites to achieving durable solutions to the challenges that threaten us all. This Council's work is also the richer for the voices and involvement of civil society in all its diversity. I encourage the Council to preserve and enhance their unique contribution and participation in this forum. I thank you. That the protection and promotion of human rights are at the heart of our common humanity, said Ms. Bachelet in her speech during the 50th Assembly of the Human Rights Council this June. One of the themes of the sessions was the human rights of migrants. Migrant comes from the Latin verb migrare, meaning to move with one's belongings to another place to live. Not least in view of the waves of refugees from countries such as Syria, Afghanistan or recently Ukraine, the terms merge, as some refugees are also asylum seekers. Asylum seekers and others, after they have fled and received asylum, can also become migrants. Migrants, asylum seekers, refugees. And whether the receiving countries fulfill their obligations to treat these people with respect and dignity was discussed by the Human Rights Council at the UN in Geneva. The Holy See was also present and lamented that too many countries do not comply or violate such rights. We are now talking to the representative of the Holy See at the UN in Geneva and always welcome guests, Archbishop Fortunatus Nbachukwu. The other is not a virus, a Pope Francis quote. Now here on EWTN TV UN blog. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres visited refugees in New York City on the occasion of World Refugee Day on June 20th. He said, highlighting concrete human situations and examples of refugees succeeding in society raises their profile in the public eye. I am now joined by Archbishop Fortunatus Nvachukwu of the Holy See. I greet you, Excellency. Chris, and good afternoon. And thank you for having me. Can we define the term migrant, or is it a catch-all term that includes refugees and asylum seekers? Oh, thank you, Christian. Of course, you know, uh, maybe you know, that we do not have um, um, an internationally uh, legal or technical definition of the word um, migrant. Um, but from the common uh, use, uh, we say that a migrant is someone who leaves uh, or who moves away uh, from his or her place of habitual or usual residence. Um, it may be within the same country or it may be across international borders. It may be permanently or it may be temporarily, but usually uh, such movement is uh, as a consequence of a number of reasons. Now, this is migra migration as a whole. Now, the difference between a migrant and a refugee is basically based on choice. Um, the migrant is the person that chooses to move from his or her place of habitual residence. The refugee is a person who is forced to leave his or her uh, place of habitual residence. Um, and the refugee is moving in search of asylum. Now, asylum, you know, the word asylum is uh, from uh, the Greek word a and zulo, that is without um, uh, predation, depredation, without violence. So it's like a kind of um, sanctuary. So the asylum seeker 
is a person moving away from a place where he or she feels threatened or his life threatened, his security or her security threatened um, in search of an asylum, a sanctuary, a place of protection. Um, that is a difference between a migrant and a refugee or an asylum seeker. In your intervention, you mentioned the so-called pushback practices, turning back migrants or forcibly returning them to their home country. As rude and inhumane as this may be, isn't this part of the sovereignty of states and about how the UN, how human rights can be enforced globally, basically overriding the sovereignty of states? Thank you, Christian. Um, the issue of pushback, also called refoulement, is quite important because many countries, or actually every country that I know, tries as much as possible to control the inflow of um, foreigners into its territory. And some countries are more open than others but practically every country tries to focus attention on its um, um, internal uh, equilibrium and interests. The whole issue of international agreements is that of trying to encourage countries in the management of the inflow of strangers into their territories to try to be more open, especially to pay attention to life-saving um, measures. Actually, the special rapporteur recommended that countries should um, embrace uh, the uh, uh, life-saving measures, integrate life-saving measures in their um, national um, uh, programs uh, for uh, treatment of people at uh, their borders, and that was a very positive thing, and we uh, try to support the rapporteur on that, because the Holy See insists on countries trying to avoid the pushback technique or refoulement. Instead of refoulement, we um, in, in, in encourage resettlement. This is what we call re in place of re resettlement in place of refoulement or pushback. Um, I think that is important. We, ha we cannot force a state to go against its internal interests. But when a state has um, endorsed or has signed onto an international agreement, we encourage, or the international community encourages the state to live up to its international agreements um, and international um, commitments. According to the Federal Statistical Office in Wiesbaden in 2020, Europe is particularly significant for migration in Germany. Most of the 21.9 million people with a migration background, that is migrants, not refugees, not asylum seekers, came from Turkey, 12.6%, followed by Poland, 9.4%, Russia, 5.6%, Romania and Italy, 4.3% and 4.2% respectively, Kazakhstan and Syria are the most important non-European countries of origin with shares of 5.2% and 4.6%. In the medium term, the proportion of people with a migration background will continue to increase. And again, for clarification, these numbers refer to migrants, not refugees and asylum seekers. For this, they are separate statistics, but our topic today is migrants. Excellency, from a Christian, biblical point of view, how does the Bible ask us to treat the other, the neighbor, the migrant? Oh, thank you, Christian. This is very... Um, important, a deep and broad theme, but I will try to be as concise as possible. I will just go back to something that is uh, striking. At the beginning of the Bible, we have the story of Cain and Abel. And we read this in the book of Genesis chapter 4. 
We know that due to um, envy, Cain killed his brother, Abel. Now, one would have expected that a person that is guilty of such a heinous crime of fratricide, killing his brother, would have been dealt in a most merciless way. And God really gave Cain his punishment. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 12, we read of God telling Cain that he would become a fugitive and a vagabond all through the earth. And then Cain told God that someone could kill him. And God said something that is important. In verse 15, he said, if anyone kills Cain, his um, uh, punishment will be sevenfold uh, that of Cain. This is important to note. That means God said that even the life of the guilty Cain is sacred and should be protected. Cain, the one that killed his brother, even though he is punished, his life remains sacred. This is something that is basic for us Christians. Life is sacred, even the life of the person that is condemned. Now, if the life of the person that is condemned sacred is sacred, think more of the life of the person that is innocent. Migrant, non-migrant, born, unborn, life is, human life is sacred. This is the basic thing. So when we move from that, the Bible telling us that the life of Cain is sacred, we then recognize, move from there to know that the life of every migrant is sacred. Now, some of these migrants are maybe um, um, delinquents that, have, that are escaping in their country, from their countries. They should be um, subjected to law, maybe sent to the prison, to jail, but their life is also sacred. There must always be the protection and the respect of the life of the migrant at every moment. So respect and protection of life, respect and protection of the dignity of the migrant, and then involvement of the migrant in the building of common good. That's the first thing. But then at a wider level, I would tell you that the position of the Bible on migrants is influenced by the experience of the people of God in the Old Testament and the Son of God in the New Testament. Now, the experience of the people of God in the Old Testament. We find that the people of God, as we know, is the Old Testament, Israel. And we find it contained in the text of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, especially verses 5 to 8, where at the presentation of the first fruits and the tithes, the person making the offering, remembers, does the profession of faith. My father was a wandering Aramean. He migrated to Egypt and there became a great nation, very populous. This summarizes the story of the people of God going back to God calling Abraham to migrate from his home Ur in, Chal in Chaldea to the promised land. This is Genesis chapter 12. 
And then after that experience, we have the various experiences of migration of the people of Israel, the exile to Babylon, and even in recent times, the uh, diaspora of the people of God. So they have the experience of being migrants, of being refugees, integrated into their history. And that has influenced the way the Old Testament speaks of migrants, that they should be treated and respected and welcomed. Their lives, their dignity should be respected and protected. In the New Testament, the Son of God, God um, in human uh, form, the Word of God made flesh according to John chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus Christ himself, he became migrant, even as a child. Let's read the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, all the way from verse 13, when the life of the child Jesus became threatened, his father was told to take him and flee to Africa, to Egypt. And he became a migrant. And that tells us that Jesus himself, being migrant, having the experience of migrant, of a migrant, also sent his disciples to become migrants around the world. No, we have to read, for example, the chapter 10 of the gospel according to Luke. It is about the experience of migrants. First, Jesus sends his disciples out to go and preach. What are they going to do? They are going to be migrating from place to place. And then he tells them, if people welcome you, it is going to be blessing. But those that reject you as you go, cast off the dust from your, your feet. Do not bring back to my community the dust of rejection of migrants. And then in that same chapter about the mission of the apostles and disciples of Jesus as migrants bearing the word of God, we have this story from verse 25 to verse 37 of that migrant that was left half, half dead on his way. And we see the story of the good Samaritan, how he treated the migrant that was ill-treated by brigands. And Jesus gives us an example there of how to treat migrants. And then still further, still further, in that same chapter, from verse 38 to verse 42, we see Jesus again as a migrant going and passing by and being welcomed by the woman called Martha in her house. So Pope Francis, commenting on that text, told, tells us that before being a teacher, Jesus is first and foremost a visitor, a pilgrim. So migrants could also be pilgrims. Migrants are also visitors, and Jesus tells us how to treat them. We could even go further. We could go and talk also of other texts where Jesus talks to us, presents to us the experience of people migrating. Think of the last mandate he gave his disciples. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he tells them, go to the whole world proclaiming the good news. As they go to the whole world proclaiming the good news, what are they going to be? They are going to be migrants, but migrants bearing the word of God. So the position of the Bible regarding migrants is very clear. I will just mention to you one case. The book of Leviticus, chapter 19, speaks about the relationship between us and our neighbors. In verse 10, it mentions specifically, um, the Bible does not speak of migrants. The Bible speaks of strangers. 
So speaks of the treatment of strangers, those that are coming. The Bible generally places them at the same level as the poor, the widows, and those in need, in need of our attention, in need of our welcome, in need of our solidarity. A Christian cannot not welcome a migrant, a stranger, as his or her neighbor. During his apostolic trip to Malta in April this year, Pope Francis exhorted, the other is not a virus, but person. In his encounter with migrants, the Pope said that his dream is that migrants, after experiencing a welcome rich in human kindness and fraternity, could themselves become witnesses and promoters of welcome and fraternity. And what is impossible for us is not impossible for God. I think, the Pope said, it is very important that migrants become witnesses of human values in today's world. They are values that you carry within you that belong to your roots as a precious heritage of humanity to bring forth and share with the communities in which you are welcomed and the areas in which you are integrated. This is the right way, the way of fraternity and social friendship. This is where the future of the human family is found in a globalized world. Thank you for watching and God bless.